Well, as we get started, I want to thank everyone. Uh, thanks for joining today's sports gambling education webinar. We are extremely excited for today's panelists who have graciously uh, given us their time and expertise. And uh, before we get started, I just want to take a couple things uh, to uh, talk with everyone about. Um, I want to thank the three partners that support and produce the SGE program. That's Ohio University's AECOM Center for Sports Administration. We've got three uh, distinguished alums on this webinar today. I want to thank the Sports Gambling Integrity Monitoring Experts at U.S. Integrity and our educational team here at Sina Education Services. My name is Scott Shelton from Cyan. I'm proud to help produce today's webinar with our esteemed panel of guest speakers. Today, we have three OU uh, alumni and some top executives from the XFL and FCF and speaking, us, well, with, uh, speaking with us today on the landscape of sports gambling sponsorships in 2021. So before we get started, I want to let everyone know of just three quick, important SGE updates. One, the all-new SG website is now live right now at sportsgamblingeducation.com, and the new site includes detailed course outlines, uh, sections dedicated to the industry and history of the program, and our webinar series, where you can go replay our March Madness uh, 2021 webinar from earlier this month, and there's even a place to find info on each of our program instructors and past webinar panelists and our experts page. So go check that out at sportsgamblingeducation.com. While you're there, you can use this promo code just for attending today's webinar. That's OUB101 for the Ohio University Bobcats. And that is good for 25% off any individual course or the master certification course bundle. And finally, number three, be sure to follow Sports Gambling Education on LinkedIn, where you can connect with friends of the program, get updates on the sports gambling industry, and stay up to date on our upcoming webinars and our new SGE courses that are set to launch later this year. We have some fantastic things lined up for 2021. You won't want to miss it. So without further ado, I'd like to quickly introduce our panel of experts for today's webinar, led by Jim Kaler, the Director of Sports Gambling Education at Ohio University, who's a regular SGE instructor and a webinar panelist. And today, Jim is joined by two other distinguished OU alumni. First up, we have Basil DeVito, Senior Advisor to Jeffrey Pollock of the XFL, who has additional sports industry experience with the WWE, the Breeders' Cup, the Indiana Pacers, and much more. And by Andy Dolich, he's the COO of the new fan-controlled football league with past experience with the San Francisco 49ers, the Grizzlies, the Oakland Athletics, the Golden State Warriors, the Washington Capitals, and more. So if we have time towards the end of today's session, uh, we'll get to a few questions from our attendees. So be sure to post those questions in the Q&A box or the chat window below. And now, uh, Jim Kaler, I turn it over to you and your panel. Thanks, Scott. And thank you, Andy and Basil, for uh, joining us today. Uh, what a pleasure it is for me to really have two of my mentors through my career on the, uh, the same webinar. But today, we're going to be talking about something that really wasn't a part of our careers back in the day when we all uh, had different responsibilities. Uh, it's the emergence of regulated sports wagering and what that's going to mean to our industry um, from a marketing standpoint, from a fan engagement standpoint, from a sponsorship standpoint, from TV. And I know that there's some uh, attendees today that want to talk a little bit about jobs. So Without further ado, I, I think what I might do is uh, start with Andy, and let's talk about fan engagement and go back to your days with, you know, the Golden State Warriors or my days with the Cavs and what we could have done had we access to had access to uh, partners in the regulated sports gambling space. I mean, can can you imagine buying a partial plan and getting a hundred dollars credit on DraftKings to to get you on board. And Andy, I'd like to just get your thoughts on where you see all this going. First and foremost, I won't speak for uh, for Basil, but distinguished in my name, that's an oxymoron. <laughs> so let's, let's get rid of that right away. Um, uh, and um, it is uh, with an incredible sense of pride that we're all Bobcat brothers and sisters. And I think back, to 50 years ago. That doesn't sound like anything that makes sense in today's world of youth and forward thinking. 
But 50 years ago is when I walked off the campus of uh, Ohio University and started my career in the business of sports. Um, no pun intended, I wouldn't have bet that I could have had the kind of career that I had at that time. And I think about the whole concept of legalized gaming or illegal gaming. And Jim, I go back to a real sort of specific focus on basketball. The, the college basketball betting scandals of the 50s, which completely rocked the country. And I think the University of Kentucky was involved in that and Adolf Rupp. Then I fast forward to um, some of the things that happened with David Stern and Tim Donaghy. I was in a meeting with a number of NBA executives when David Stern was handed a piece of paper and he opened the paper and it's the only time I ever saw David Stern with his, with his brain going in 14 different directions. And it was the information that Tim Donaghy was being investigated by the FBI for uh, that scandal. And then you think about fast forwarding to Adam Silver, I think the position paper that he wrote in 2015 about moving the NBA into legalized gaming because it was part of our society. And you know that's a quick 50 year trip when you think about you know what one commissioner saw as the potential um, end of his league. I mean, if that thing had gone as deep as it could have gone, it could have been the end of the NBA. And then another commissioner um, and Adam and David were very close going, I welcome it. It's part of our society today. Uh, let's figure out the proper structure. And for anybody to say that a master's program, a university would teach what you're teaching a few years ago, they would have said, I'm sorry. No, that's absolutely impossible. So I like to think through the windshield and not the rearview mirror, and I can't wait to see what's going to happen in the future. Well, good, good. Uh, I'm going to circle back on fan engagement, but Basil, you and I were talking the other day, and um, sitting where you see, sit, um, some of the progressive moves that the XFL made with XFL1, and then most recently, um, as you're looking into the future, um, what, 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 what's going on in that crystal ball? Well, first of all, I haven't had a chance to say hello to Andy. So hello, Andy. And I can't believe they left out the Washington diplomats closest to my heart. So, um, yeah. And uh, the Maryland Arrows indoor box lacrosse team. Um, and not, and not, yeah. But following up first on one thing that Andy said about uh, the program itself, the idea that an institution would be teaching this course of study. I would think that when Andy and I know myself, went to OU for sports master's degree. That was out of the box 50 years ago. So um, I, always, I think you hit the nail on the head there. With, um, with the XFL, I think, and, and Jim and I chatted about this a little bit, just the snippets in the same way uh, Andy was saying, the, uh, the, the 10 poll events in 2000, when the XFL was uh, launched the first time, the fact that um, it was WWE and the network, there were articles being written that said the linebackers were going to use folding chairs. And, you know, <laughs> people didn't know whether it was going to be scripted or real competitive football. So that obviously we're out there trying to uh, promote and get as much viewership and interest as possible. So we actually held a uh, scrimmage game, full game conditions, full rules in Sam Boyd Stadium in Vegas. And the only people there were the race and sports book managers who we brought there specifically, made relationships with them, said, look, this is our game. And the leading guys of, you know, how it all is, there were a couple that were the, the, the leading edge, though they said, you're in. The first week, there'll be a line. And we thought that was really important because if there was a line on it, no one was going to write the story that it was WWE-like and scripted. So that's where we were in 2000. Flash forward to 2019. Now the XFL's coming back. It is now only Vince. But And there was less of that, and Vince was less forward-facing, um, so there wasn't a lot. But 
the AAF had failed. Um, so we had to convince them again. And thank God, two of those guys, one runs DraftKings Sportsbook, one runs Vison, and we were able to work with them. And ultimately, we went to every um, a state that had a, a commission and we presented in front of every commission. We, can, uh, we had a, the rules, uh, uh, the schedule, the, 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 the insurance for the players, everything that we had to make them comfortable, especially after they got stuck when the AAF went away and they couldn't pay off all the AAF wagers. Then of course, first week we on ABC network, first game right up there, we put the spread and the over under and the announcers talk about the uh, spread of the game. And we thought, wow, we are breaking ground. This is so cool. This is forever. And what is going to happen is two years from now, that's going to look like the Stone Age. So between 2020 and 20, uh, 2000 and 2020, we moved about this far and we thought, oh, now there's, wow, we put the lines on the air. Boy, was I proud. Two years from now, or who knows how much sooner, but that'll, we'll be talking about that as the Ice Age. So um, I think that's what's happened. I think we're going to have a real hockey stick effect. And uh, it's going to affect everything. And, you know, to, to just pull one one little point, um, and I don't say this with uh, too much pride, but how things change so quickly in today's society, right? Not looking back, but when the Rudy Gobert domino hit, everything changed, not just in the world of sports, but in the world of the world. And as... Um, as Basil mentioned, the Alliance of American Football, the XFL, little old fan controlled football went to the XFL and bought in one of the great deals of all time, much of their equipment for not a lot of money. I won't go into the specifics, but if you look at the greatest transaction of the FCF, it would be the purchase of equipment from the XFL. Um, that took us through our season. But Basil is absolutely right. If you look at this as a Jules Verne, H.G. Uh, Wells future, the amount of change that is going to occur each month, each year, each decade is going to make the last 50 years look like um, it was a thousand years. All right. So, Andy, let's talk a little bit about fan-controlled football, you are cutting edge with a lot of the things you're doing, but sports gambling had to add to the overall value of the league because sports gambling is going to be higher TV ratings or fan engagement. And uh, before you know it, and if you're allowed to tell us anything about uh, in-game prop bets. So where, yeah. where, where are you in the process? Well, we just completed our first six-week season with four teams, and I knew we were sort of growing up when a lot of the betting lines started taking uh, money on FCF games. So we took some bets. I really don't have, not that I'm holding it close, don't have those numbers, but because it is what I call ISE, Immersive Sports and Entertainment. And everybody looks for, oh, that's brand new. Well, if you go back to Bill Vex 75 years ago, he had it. I grew up as a wrestling fan on Long Island with Bruno San Martino and Cowboy Bob Ellis and uh, Bobo Brazil. And I could go on for, for decades. <laughs> but that was immersive sports and entertainment. When you went to a wrestling event, the fans were part of the action and the wrestlers knew it. And Vince's dad knew it. So nothing has really changed, but now we have this. And this has changed everything, right? I mean, you can look at it. It is a football field. It is a basketball court. It is a wrestling ring. It's all of this. So from a gaming standpoint, in our first season, we wanted to make sure that the game itself, the football was quality in arena. We did that. The protocols were unbelievably important to us because you're dealing with human life. And we came out of that in a very positive position. Now, as we look for year two, we haven't announced it um, officially, but we're going to have a year two. 
um, which some of the other leagues didn't necessarily have. But we're not going against the NFL. We're creating a model in which fans can totally immerse themselves in the play calling, in the selection of players in a draft, in making decisions. And what is the most immersive? I got some money. I'm smarter than you. I want to bet on this play. I want to bet on that team. I want to bet that the game is going to end in an incredibly exciting way on the prop bet. And, and we're really looking forward to it and are really working in our own laboratory to figure out how we maximize it for season two. Okay, Baze, I want to go back when you were on campus for the uh, 20th anniversary of the XFL ESPN 30 for 30. And we had a conversation and you said, what's different? What's going to be different about XFL 2? And you basically said, there's a new revenue stream that's about to take off. And it's called sports gambling. So um, you saw some of the impact with XFL 2 on that, but it also played some role as you negotiated the television contracts. Can you share some of that with our, with our audience? Yeah. As Andy was talking, you know, um, and I don't know, I've done some, some research and I, and I have uh, uh, observed a bit of the uh, uh, fan control league. The, the thing about it is what, what you're doing um, Andy, which makes so much sense is that the issue is, um, control and ownership. There is a process from the moment the event happens on the field, we'll talk about football, when the data, because it's data, it's not necessarily co- uh, uh, entertainment. Hey, I, yeah, Basil, let me interrupt for one second, because yeah. I didn't learn this at OU, and Kaler is an educator, right, an instructor, right. a professor or something. <laughs> is it data or data? <laughs> I've been completely confused in my it, entire it, adult life. Is it what, tomato? What is, it? is it tomato well, it or it tomato? Way, uh, I went to high school in the Bronx and it was data, but the smarter people say data to me. Okay, so uh, I, then I, I'll I, go with both. I just wanted to double check. But, with but, you know, from when it leaves the stadium, issues of latency and, and uh, prioritary and all the rest. And it gets all the way to the app in the home of a viewer fan better all the way along the line. There are, there's licensing issues. There's uh, integrity issues. There's all these things. And a league like the XFL, and we'll talk about 2000, I mean, 2020, 2020 last year, we're dependent upon broadcast partners to distribute it because we're selling tickets, we're selling advertising, we're selling sponsors. All the broadcast entities are vertically aligned with some gambling, gaming uh, entity. And there are restrictions. And that right now, at least even for the XFL and certainly for even the bigger leagues, is an issue because you have a lot of partnerships and a lot of um, aspects to uh, navigate. Whereas if I understand the fan control league properly, um, you know, it's going directly from the league right to the fan and the ability to control and, oh, now may parcel it out, may make a deal, whatever, but the ability to own and control that system is the only way ultimately, I think, to crack the code. Um, And I think the, the most traditional forms of leagues, and I'll put the XFL 2020 in that, the one example I would give is we were headed down the road and I was uh, a big champion of this, that with only eight teams, 10 week season, bound to have tie in the standings. Okay, we're gonna have a tie in the standings. Okay, they're gonna play each other twice, First uh, tiebreaker, head-to-head, simple wins. Now, in the history of all the sports and all the leagues that we've ever dealt with and football, there's tiebreakers, seven deep, points, uh, common opponents, differential, everything. The idea we had was the second tiebreaker after head-to-head was record versus the spread. Well, in order to do that, you need an official spread. And we're... We, we got the coaches in. We're ready to go. Well, the problem is we had two broadcasters with two different 
um, uh, deals with two different sets of, uh, um, you know, entities. One was MGM, one was FoxBet, et cetera. And the fact is we could never navigate that with our broadcast partners. So we, while we felt we have a blank slate, we can do anything, we're single entity, we're aggressive. Ultimately, the gatekeeper was our broadcast partner. We are 100% dependent upon our two broadcast partners to, to produce and distribute the games. So at a very early part in that process, we hit the gatekeeper and we were stuck. So that's, I think, going to be an important aspect, which I do believe what, from the little I do understand, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Andy, I think over the four weeks, your, the streams went from hundreds to millions of people participating. Uh, 7.5 7. Is- 7. million total live views on Twitch during the season. And to your point, Basil and Jim, um, more than 2 million real-time play calls. So I look at those play calls as dollar signs Bingo. as Bingo. we become yeah. more yeah. sophisticated. And the great part about all this is when we were at OU, um, we, we thought about America, North America. Sport hadn't quite become the global entity that it is today. And now it's everywhere, whether it's wrestling, whether it's football, whether it's soccer, polo or cricket. And the United States, I think, is sort of pulling up the rear in sophisticated gaming. If you look at Great Britain and Asia and all that, they're way ahead of us, right? And and, uh, just quick anecdote, I don't know what happened to me, but during COVID, we got a puppy. So it's like having (laughs) a baby. So Saturday night at 1 a.m., I had to get up to deal with the puppy. And what did I do before I went back to bed? I bet live on Twin Spires, the Hong Kong Derby and watched (laughs) and wagered live. So that that is just the tip of the iceberg, because those of us who have, you know, an interest in betting and horse racing is a small minority compared to those who when it's easy and it's a click and it's there which it is today in horse racing, um, when it's there for the, the most popular sports like football, it'll be dramatic. And Jim, from a fundraising standpoint, what Basil omitted is uh, Beagle Boy won the race and paid $150,000. <laughs> so you need to hit him up for another donation to OU. Okay? Well, he, he's been, listen, he's been awful kind to us over the years, but it usually... His donation usually comes in after the Kentucky Derby. But <laughs> shifting, shifting gears for a second, Andy, you just said something. We have been approached by everybody that's associated with sports gambling, and we're learning more and more, but cause-related betting is going to be a part of the future. So if you win a bet, a percentage of your winnings could go to Ohio University. If you lose a bet, um, a percentage of that, so the – Draft kings of the world make about a 5% margin on a bet. And if they want to give 1% back to a charity to make sports gambling more socially acceptable in our world, uh, it's already happening in Brazil. So l- look out and get ready. You know? Well, and, and the perfect point is, um, yes, there are incredible challenges in our country. Um, in terms of social aspects. But if you look at players, if you look at celebrities, and let's just take Dwayne Johnson, where he came from, where he is now, LeBron James, Steph Curry, players that have created businesses that are billion-dollar businesses or $100 million businesses, the level of community support and actual care of what they've done to put back to their communities. Again, you know a little bit more about LBJ because of where you grew up, Jim, but that will also go to your point of community orientation. There's disposable income in our country and why not put it back to build those, build on those that are less fortunate than some of us. Yeah, a good example would be University of Colorado was one of the 
first power fives outside of Vegas to accept a sports gambling sponsorship. So that this is new category coming in that we all didn't have back in the days when, you know, Basil was with the Pacers and you and I, Andy, were doing our team thing. Um, so this new category, all of a sudden is worth more than the soft drink category. I was so I was so lucky when I went to Memphis uh, because we had a smaller business community. But then somebody said, hey, do you know Tunica? <laughs> and I go like, what's a Tunica? And then they <laughs> took me to Tunica with 13 casinos. And the benefit at that time, 2000 to 2007 or eight, was that none of those casinos had sports books. So we could take their money for golf, entertainment, spas, travel. And of course, a few NBA players, unnamed like Charles Barkley and Michael Jordan, would go to Tunica as quickly as they could in a limo and unload that extra money that they had. So those casinos were all big supporters of ours. And now that you look at what Monumental is doing, right, Ted Leonsis and others to follow in creating sports books in their arenas and facilities. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing. Well, what, so what, one of the things that I want to talk about is not sponsorship, but partnerships, whether it's DraftKings or MGM or Monkey Knife Fight or whoever, and the data they're going to be getting their hands on and cross promotions to help us sell tickets as an industry. This might be the most powerful partner uh, sports has ever seen. So I would love to get your insights there. No, Basil, I, I know you had a deal in place with monkey knife fight and then well and into a problem right you know it's it's one of those things and i know andy and i have had the chance to be at a lot of different places startup or reposition and and it's an exciting time whenever you do it and so obviously last year just getting the league up and operating and then you know the promise of this money from this sports gambling area no one's really kind of figured it out yet right and you're trying to figure out can we do a sponsorship can we do an official partnership how do we do it and i gotta tell you the first time my jordan schlachter is our uh, chief commercial officer the first time he said monkey knife fights i had no clue of what he was talking about none and um so they don't, at the time, now I'm talking uh, basically a little more than a year ago, or just before we kicked off in February. And, um, you know, I thought it was a, you know, a kid's video game, Monkey Night Fights. I didn't know what the heck it was. And, but they didn't buy national advertising. So what are we going to do? And literally, uh, Jordan was able to work out a two by two sticker on the back of the helmet only their logo, nothing more. And we exposed it on, and they were a local LA team sponsor. And we exposed uh, their logo on the back of the helmets. What happened? One of our two network partners felt it was conflict with their deal. One didn't. And so we actually had a team of people who would go to the LA uh uh, stadium, and depending upon which network was doing the game, they would apply stickers or take them off. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and w of course, we only did that for five weeks, and we were just head, you know, and that's that's the ground with the existing situation with your network partners is there's a lot of new ground. And there was it was a, a very thin slice that we were able to work out with one, and we were working on the other one. But we're in business, so we take half of the pie rather than uh, than none of it. But I fully anticipate that we would have been able to help grow them into an advertiser uh, within, you know, and bring new right. money to our television partner because they weren't spending national advertising and they would have done in our games. But we just didn't have enough time. And if you think about the future, which is what we're talking about, think about that. AI, 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 um, and artificial intelligence, which to a certain extent we exhibit in the United States every day, not in a <laughs> positive manner, but artificial intelligence, to your point, Jim, 
getting everything about individuals. How do they think? The movie Minority Report happens to be a favorite of mine of many years ago to figure out how people make decisions. And that is incredibly powerful, especially in sports where people are so invested in the event and not just the event, but the combine and the draft and the trading and the arguments and the officials calls and on and on and on. It's the perfect 12 month engagement. And the thing that is most exciting to me um, and, and Andy's pointed out a couple of ways, ultimately we will get to move. It's been one of the bugaboos for me forever, especially when you're working with uh, what people would consider maybe a not have whether it WWE or XFL or even thoroughbred horse racing, not one of the the center stage major sports. And you talk about ratings. Oh, your ratings are, your ratings are, it's participation. This will take away the eye. If, if, if the 2 million people streaming all participate by sending bets or whatever it actually there's better even better than bets is reaction picking plays um you know all the things they're able to do that direct line relationship is is better than ratings because you can monetize that and and i I, you know i'd be remiss not to it's to me and i have been out of the wwe for over a year now so none of this is me suggesting uh taking any pats on the back but if you take a look at just the, the value in the five-year, seven-year play, the WWE, 12 pay-per-views a year, 12, you know, remember, got $49, $79. So Sunday night, WrestleMania, bring them people in the home promoting, which basically was just an extension of the gate. Pay-per-view went away for the WWE over-the-top network. Man, was that aggressive and risk-taking and you create the WWE network and now you have 1.6 million people paying 10 bucks a month. And wow. Yeah. And then what happened? Nope. We're going to sell it all to the Peacock network and be in front of 25 million people. And Basil and I, and you, Jim, we've spent a large part of our life trying to sell little pieces of cardboard to people to come see our events, right? LPCs. Now the LPC is a little piece of carbon that's inside this. And to my point, um, I don't believe in the new normal. I believe in the new different. Those people that embrace the new normal, good luck to you. Knock yourself out. But if you're not embracing the new different, you're screwed. And the amount of fans coming to actual events, that's going to be very, very difficult to really gauge over the next year. And so if you can get involved and immerse in any way possible through this, which you can, and you can play with your money, the extra money, you're going to do that. So I think the construct of live viewership in sports to Basil's point about ratings, where everybody go, oh, it's down. Like, yeah, but what do you know about Twitch? What do you know about Venn? What do you know about the newest gaming platform that has millions of people following it that some suit in New York knows nothing about. Right. So, Andy, I want to go back to your days with the Oakland A's. If you had that position today and all of a sudden the state of California um, legalizes uh, sports wagering, what kind of cross promotions would you be doing with DraftKings and others to get more people out to games? Well, well first, first and foremost, I was one of the first guys in baseball to do dot racing. So <laughs> I, I would I would call up Boveda or whoever else, and I'd say, I want to start taking a line on dot racing. <laughs> uh, now, I'm, I'm being somewhat uh, facetious, but if you think baseball, people go, oh, well, baseball's boring, and I don't get it. The sophistication of baseball for people who really know it, the pitches – where infielders are moving on a particular play, signage, all of that um, has great betting potential. How do I know? You know, you see the the, uh, pitching coach go out to the mound, blah, 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 and the catcher. 
all right, well, what the hell is this pitch going to be? Can you imagine in the ninth inning with bases loaded, the kind of betting capabilities and traction that you could get? So I would literally, and I think Monumental did it when they're building their casino at their arena in Washington, and they weren't allowing any fans, but they had kiosks outside of the arena in Washington taking bets on NFL games with long lines. So if you're a sports fan, you're betting, you could bet on everything, whether you're a brilliant handicapper like Basil, who never <laughs> loses a race, or some dumb clock like me who just bets an exacta or a trifecta. So I'd want to go on player performance. I'd want to go on management decisions. And again, I go back to my idol, Bill Veck, who had fans hold up a piece of cardboard at games in 1954 to predict what the play was going to be next, bunt, hit, or whatever. That would go back to the manager, like fan-controlled football, and that's what they'd have to do. Bunt, hit away, hit to the opposite side. Yeah. Why can't that happen today? Instantaneously with incredible latency. Right. Which, which, and the, and the bottom line is, which I've, I, it has been taught to me, nothing I figured out myself, football is the perfect game for this. It's, it's regimented by time. It's a, a very regimented situation. It allows for, which, which we proved last year. I mean, think about, forget about that. The XFL did it or whatever. It's just because we had the ability and no one telling us we couldn't. But we were feeding the coaches information from the coach to the quarterback to the booth. So forget how you use it, where it goes. It's possible. We wanted to make sure an FCF, you know, like uh, I won't mention a coach, but John Gruden, right? <laughs> when you go down and, and the coach is like this, like, give me a break. Everybody in the world knows every play ever invented in the history of football. And you see the coach, blah, 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 blah. like oh, somebody's listening in on you. Like you don't see any coaches in the FCF or the XFL too, who are going to have that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, well, and I want to shift gears for a second, though, but think of both of you starting the master's program, oh, let's say this August, and we got this new vertical out there, and there are jobs, and there's going to be more jobs in the area of um, sports gambling. So we get a lot of kids that still want to be like every place. They want to be the general manager of their favorite NFL football team. If DeVito but, and Dolish and Kaler got to these positions, <laughs> any freaking moron could do it. Right, right. But, but we just had a student uh, who graduated recently. His whole job is to watch games and be an analyst and help provide input on line shifting and that. Like, not a bad job, huh? So, but it's, I, I have to tell you, and, um, you know, I do have a 29 year old who I've, um, you know, led down the path of uh, handicapping and horse racing. And it's amazing the need for young people, not necessarily to be a tout for either horse racing or football or anything else, but as Andy said, explain and show the different information and aspects that, that somebody at home can use, how to use them, how to get them. They, they're less interested in getting an answer. They're, they want to know how they make their answer. Right, right. But I, I, I have followed uh, a gentleman. How much, how much money went down the tubes <laughs> this week? Right. I mean, of people that wouldn't know a basketball from a polo pony. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What what did you pick? the? Did you pick the Bobcats over Virginia or not? Uh, I, I'm not at liberty to show that. <laughs> yeah, I did. I I'm I'm dumb. I, I went the wrong way. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I was dead that Sunday. It was over. But think about how many hundreds of millions of dollars was bet. Um, even virtually these days of people 
that they don't know anything, but that's a cool name, or I like their color or their mascot, and I've always played. Well, and, and the excitement that you could win big. So I'm, I'm looking yep. at our attendees today, and one of our Bobcat alums, Todd Overton, has been in the business yeah. of uh, underwriting hole-in-ones and perfect scores and everything. But just that excitement of going into the ballpark that maybe you're going to – Maybe you're going to predict nine things that happened that day and you're going to get a hundred to one payback. That all of a sudden makes the evening a little bit of in- interesting when you're five for five, right? I well, sent out on social media. I was so proud of myself after day one. I was 1,119th, 1, 154th in the United States on my picks. Now that's not easily done, right? And how, <laughs> how long did it take for the, uh, the perfect bracket scenario to go away was it that's uh, an oxymoron in this year yeah. perfect bracket yeah well yeah. jim to what you were talking about in high todd um you know horse racing which is perfectly built for this has a limited appeal compared to our traditional sports and, and certainly football and all the rest horse racing may or may not be able to crack that code but think about, and I'll use the XFL as an example. We did not do this, but we considered it. Think about a Sunday, your first Sunday, you have four or six games, you run them. We, you know, they, they start in 15 minute increments at one o'clock and then between four and five, four or five games come to conclusion. And I think Scott, uh, Todd would tell us if you're, if you're looking at, you know, win and spread and maybe over under somewhere between, you know, six, eight, ten uh, selections. You can have, you can guarantee millions of dollars of pool there, um, and it would be boom, 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 boom in one hour, pay off. So there, the idea that people will uh, only, uh, you know, the the proposition, the big, um, um, you know, bonus bet, just like a pick six in football. Uh, I mean, in baseball, uh, I'm sorry, in horse racing, just like a pick six, there's a 20 cent bet now. And the pools get to three or four million dollars. And yes, it's only those of us in the horse racing community that think about it. But if this were football and you can put a 50 cent bet on some combination of things. And, and there's a great point, Basil. I, I was just thinking about it when you were speaking. In the world of betting on horse racing around the world, what percentage of people ballpark really know anything about handicapping the jockeys, the horses' bloodlines, as opposed to, I love the name, or, wow, that jockey, you know, has great silks. I'm going with that. It, it's, you know... I think, especially when you talk about around the world, you know, in the United States, there are, I believe, four or five days a year that handle over a hundred million dollars, the triple crown, the breeders cup, two days, and maybe Oaks day, maybe, maybe again, all prior to last year in Hong Kong, every day they run is more than a hundred million dollars. And well, Jim, that, you, note, that point that I gave to you, sorry to interrupt, but I'm a serial interrupter. Um, Super Bowl, <laughs> uh, not this year, but last year, $5.2 billion on one game. Yeah. How many people really knew yeah. everything about the players, their history? Like, it's, it's, it's ease, community, common shared experience. And that becomes the, the, guy, the guys that we were, uh, too many decades ago, you know, um, what you're promoting, how you're just trying to break through uh, before, you know, we had, I think we had a great situation that sports wasn't big business when we started. So it, it was, it, we had to learn and do things. And now that's going to happen again. How do you make it interest? And that's why, again, why I think things like the fan control football league ownership and control until you can figure out what partnerships and what procedures are going to be there. Cause you still are in some, if you're talking domestically, what, you know, even when it gets to be 27 States, it's still not all of them. So but you Andy, still have things to deal with. Andy on ownership control, 
Uh, Monkey Knife Fight was one of the sports books that, as part of the sponsorship, would give back to your league a percentage of the bet. Now, Dra DraftKings and FanDuel and others are just spending incredible amounts of money on sponsorship, but there's actually been some revenue sharing. So have you guys well, looked at you that? Think, you think about FCF. Um, we decided that we let fans own pieces of the team, you know, not since the days of the Green Bay Packers and, and others. So we, we sort of under promise and got over delivered. We had 2000 fans collectively invest more than a million dollars on our teams and they had to do it in $150 increments. Who knew? Now we have more and more of that. And as you look at other sports, we have all had the ability to work for centimillionaires, now multi-billionaires, because a centimillion isn't going to get you very far in the big four sports. But why shouldn't the fans have a piece on how much more money you could make? To Basil's point, the Oakland A's, when I went to work from in 1981, the Haas family, the people that own Levi Strauss, paid $11.2 million for the team. And, and the Warriors just moved into a building two years ago that cost $1.8 billion. Well, and so, I read something today, which I think is a great example, um, a little off the, tr uh, the uh, main track. The CEO of DraftKings last year, young gentleman, made four point two years ago, made $4.4 million. That's great for a young $4.4 million right here. <laughs> this year he made $270 million. Yeah. End well, of the, story. Well, the End sports, story. the sports, that's what's happening. The sports gambling industry is going to be, if it's not already, if you count legal and illegal bets, it's bigger than the sports business industry. So well, as you say that, you know, when I talk uh, and I'm not as knowledgeable as you guys, not even close, but when I use the example of that one gigantic pot of money on the Super Bowl, how much money did the MVP of the game get? Zero. How much money did the NFL get? Zero. How much money did the networks get that broadcast the game? Double zero. What about the Players Association? Zero. What about the local school? And on and on and on and on until that's all worked out. As much as we see this absolute tsunami of money it's still gonna be a while right guys yeah. until it gets parceled out and we don't have to worry about the legitimacy of our games because as soon as that blows up we're screwed yeah, yeah but they, they, the money is really in the the broadcast right so the nfl just gets done going up to 10 billion dollars right but I would love to see the verbiage in those contracts as what the leagues are now going to be allowed to do as it relates to sports wagering. And the NFL is going to loosen up. They, they have to. Well, it, it's, um, I think the thing coming out of those, I think the NFL um, helped slow down the migration from traditional what we would talk television cable television linear television and yes i know there's a streaming component but it's still day date and time yeah so i, I think i'm glad it happened i'm an old guy i'm not looking to disrupt <laughs> the whole world um but i do think it's important to, to to see as those lines are moving right where now monday night football is flex starting week 12 with a 12 day notice right so will they go to a 17th game what yeah, it, how's that gonna the, work the fan is the fan you know listen 12 we, you bought a one o'clock game in buffalo sorry next week it's going to be monday night it's it's things are changing but at least right. the uh, broadcast i think they staved it and, off and when you years. think about what we've all experienced in the world of sports in north america over the last year plus the NFL, with such a Mount Everest of money before this deal, 52 billion bucks in the bank, they just pulled their way through COVID to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. Everybody, not that they weren't absolutely working medically, not that they didn't care about their players and their staff, but they went, boom, we're going right through the line and we're going to get on the other side of it. And they did. Yep. Yeah. All right, so wait, 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 we're at the 10-minute mark, and I'm going to take a couple of 
questions from the audience. So just sit back and I'll, I'll read them out. This is kind of a sponsorship question, but how might the rise of digital assets, which every team is selling now because that's what sponsors want, affect the betting industry? Well, I'll just answer it very quickly. I learned early on uh, what is, you know, everybody slices and dices, demographics, psychographics, all that. Sports, the demographic is people that eat. Yep, mm. that's people that eat. That's the demo in sports. And so to that question, you just figure out what the numbers are, how many people are following it, how many businesses are integrated into it, and boom, you have a transaction. The color of the fluid that flows through the veins of sports is green. And if you can't figure it out, then do something else. All right. Another, the, another, the, another, the, another, another quick one in somewhat related, but uh, new technology with blockchain and crypto. I saw where the Miami Heat Arena has now got a um, cryptocurrency as, as a sponsor on the naming rights. But how might that um, play a role with increasing fan betting confidence and, and more participation in sports gambling. And how can we, this gentleman must sell sponsorships for a team and how can we leverage that from a partnership perspective? So all of a sudden we got a new category. Andy. It's called. Well, I, I think <laughs> when Andy was talking, what I was going to lead from that, which I think still leads into this is for the most part, people that are listening and talking right now and a lot of our backgrounds are in individual teams rather than running leagues. So if we talk about from an individual team, the benefit of the digital is the ability to customize. So if you're a, an NBA team, it's a lot different in Washington where, they're, where, you're, where there's the betting, betting kiosks as opposed to some other place where there's no legalized betting in the state. So I think the b value of the digital aspect is it gives you a chance to create customized content and develop a one-on-one -on -one relationship with those who are consuming that content. Because again, I'll say it again, you have control and ownership of what you do. Whereas in the full league mantra, there's not much you can do about what you, 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 you've got the guardrails of what you can do as an individual team in the most, in the more traditional media outlets. So I think that could be the value of digital. And yeah, where we might've, we might've had a nightcap on court street. Now those posses, those pods are hanging together. And if they're at a game or an event and somebody goes, Hey, it's happening over here. Boom. They're gone. And yep. they're involved in whatever is next. So if you are not the most agile, nimble person in any business, but surely sports, you can be left out. And I mean, you think about boxing and, and horse racing. And yeah. now, to a certain extent, they've been uh, left behind. 19, yes, 19, wait, wait, wait. 1950, two most popular sports in our country were boxing and horse racing. So a lot can happen, you know, over 50, 70 years. Well, um, and, and, and yeah, go ahead. All right. So wait, wait, I just want to got a question. I knew this might come up, but what advice would you give a current college student trying to get into the sports gambling space? Either one of you guys could take it. Well, right. well Jason has more experience. I'll let him go. First. Well, I will say two things, especially for having some young people in my own family. One yeah. is just like anything else, participate. It, it, user under, because you're young and the ability to be a, uh, a, a, an end product user, understand the product because the system from, again, when it leaves the arena stadium or studio to where it gets to somebody mashing a button and making a bet is a long chain with a lot of stops, a lot of regulation, a lot of um, uh, financial considerations. And understanding the end user and being able to work back up, that will give you a chance to understand which piece of this do I want to be? Is it a regulatory situation? Is it a, a sales situation? Is it a deal making situation? But all of those functions are going to be highly uh, leveraged all the way across the chain. And no organization, I don't believe in the traditional sports world, is going to handle that 
from beginning to end. They're going to keep pieces of it and have to lay off or partner other pieces of it. Again, why things like fan football are intriguing to me because out of necessity, right? What we were told it's mother of invention. They, you guys are figuring out how to get a million people at a particular time to interact with your product. I would just have a big number, right? I would just have a visual. You see what this is. And I would say to those men and women become this, become a Swiss army knife. If you just fall in love with gaming or analytics or metrics or um, communications in today's world, you need to be a master to a certain extent of all of these. And programs like OU and others are teaching the full group of skills that you need. So I would be very careful not to just look at one area because as you move up the chain, even if you're an expert in gambling, you're gonna need to be an expert in HR. You're gonna need to be an expert in marketing, leadership, integrity, and teamwork. So think about the Swiss army knife and try to be that. Right, and Luke, this question came from Luke. Um, Luke, I have no idea if you're a student from Ohio University or not, but the program we've put together with this executive ed, we have students now with that certificate. It's a point of difference when DraftKings is looking at your resume. So. Uh, not a huge investment, but you're going to need to separate yourself from the competition because there'll be a lot of people going in. All right. I want to go to our crystal ball questions. Andy, looking into your crystal ball, we're going to do this again in five years. What's I have a crystal ball. Yeah. I, so, I, have a, I love to oh, just have all. I have a crystal so right, so ball. What, one of the things that I hope happens sooner and not five years from now with fan control football is that I'll be able to go in there find my friend and just bet with my friend it's coming. So if you look at fan controlled football and sports in general, five years from now, we're having the same conversation. What are we talking about? What's it look like? I think you'll see more sports taking some increment of immersivity, bringing their fans inside decision-making um, so that it's not just a darkened room where the general manager and the chief scout are making a decision to blow $100 million on a guy that can't play. Um, I think you're going to see more and more sports adapt, letting fans inside what they believed were their secret world. And I would just, I, I was working on this before. You gave me this really expensive item when I came, and <laughs> it says, Ohio University, but these things I just uh, I just pasted on. And Ohio University, right? The Bobcats stand for change. And if you're not ahead of change and you don't see it coming in any business, you're going to be left behind. So you don't want to get too far ahead in predicting the future, but you want to be involved in entities that understand change, like OU, and understand what the change is going to be in the world of sports, which is going to be more fan control. Okay, Basil, same question, but I want to add a little bit to it. You spent a lot of your career negotiating TV deals with broadcast entities. Looking into your crystal ball, what, what, what do you think it's going to look like five years from now? Well, two things. I was thinking about, before the TV aspect of it, I was thinking about, I am pretty convinced, and I'll use, the, I'll use Amazon Prime, but it could be a name we haven't even heard yet, but I think fans will be able from their home to buy everything, whether that includes going to the game, getting the t-shirt or staying home, um, decorations, food for the game, um, uh, materials, information, promotional aspects. I think you'll be able to do it all from the home. So if I'm going to the Cleveland Indians game on the 4th of July, I'm not buying the T-shirt at the stadium. I'm going with it because it was delivered to me and I'm wearing it to the game. I already bought it. Um, every aspect of it is going to be able to do from your home. Or I can't go. The game sold out. Hopefully, for all of us, that's happening again. And I'm going to have it at home and I'm getting the stadium mustard along with, um, you know, all the other stuff I order. So I believe that's turnkey and that's coming. On the TV side, um, I think it's vertical integration on both sides and partnership. 
I just don't think you can negotiate your way through all of these intricacies that are now happening. Um, I think it's more likely that um, a league will, again, I got to take the N NBA and the NFL. They're just too complex and too big. I really don't know. But emerging properties and properties that are underserved, um, you know, uh, the WNBA, whatever it might be, properties that have the gravitas that they need, but have been underserved and um, – <laughs> Um, um, will be able to make a partnership where they'll be able to, but it'll be far more integrated all the way down and have to do it up front. And I want, I want to get the feeling of what it's like to do a 180 off the top rope and pin a guy in a wrestling match. I want to know what it feels like to have a 38 inch vertical. I want to know what it feels like without actually taking the hit from the linebacker. And I think the technology is going to get us more and more that we can live as avatars as these incredible athletes, because that's what we really want to be at the end of the day. Yeah. All right. Well, gentlemen, we're, we're right at that hour. I want to bring Scott back in because we have a discount offer for anybody that is serious about, you know, getting a uh, certificate in sports gambling, but, Thank you um, so much. And I'm going to throw it back to, uh, to Scott. Thank you. Great. Well, Thank you. Great, great job, guys. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to um, just say, you know, on behalf of Ohio University, U.S. Integrity and Siena, thank you again to our panelists, Andy Dolich and Basil DeVito. And uh, thanks to Jim Kaler for leading this fantastic conversation. Again, to all of our attendees, you know, be sure to check out the all new sports gambling education.com for information about our online education program with OU. And we'll be sure to uh, post a link to our panelists on this webinar there. So don't forget, follow us on LinkedIn for info about the next SGE webinar. That'll be April 8th with Matt Holt from US Integrity discussing tribal gaming. And like Jim mentioned, use OUB 101 for 25% off your uh, next course purchase or the course bundle. So uh, again, thank you so much and we'll see you next time.